this is an hour, hour and a half long session. We will begin with introductions from uh, and presentations from Daniel and John Sweeney, um, followed by a Q&A session, which will be conducted from our panelists in London. Is everything loud and clear, Daniel and John? Sure, I think yes. it's been going in and out, but we can hear you now. Very good. Sorry for the interruptions. I would like to commence the uh, the session with uh, with the uh, with the uh, with the input from from Washington. Thank you. Sure. Um, so what we're going to do briefly, I know that you guys have two, sometimes three, glorious days of FATCA. So we're not going to go into detail about every single provision we've done. Um, what we're going to try to do is take this from a high level and talk about the reasons for the changes we made and explain, you know, some of the government's thinking. Um, we'll leave it to the other sessions to go really into detail about all of our provisions. Right, and when Danielle mentions the changes that we made, you know, we issued two notices, three notices actually, uh, prior to the issuance of the proposed regs. Uh, that notice 2010-60 and 2011-34, the primary ones that actually gave the most, uh, you know, at least proposed tentative guidance. And uh, we'll, we'll highlight some of the differences and expansions on things uh, relative to the proposed regs. So I'm going to start talking about the payee definition and um, you know the changes to the election to pass up that were made. Um, I'll go into some of the due diligence changes with respect to individuals and entities. John will talk about the definition of financial accounts, um, the definition of an account holder, some of the withholding requirements, and also some of the reporting requirements. And then I'll come back and finish up with some of the deemed compliant changes. Um, so to start with, um, We'll start with the definition of a payee, and I just want to clarify that we've had some questions about this. It is a little complicated. We did not make this complicated just to torture you. There is a good reason for this. Um, the reason the payee definition is the way it is, is we were trying as much as possible to follow what was done in Chapter 3. So that I think the Chapter 3 model generally makes the payee the person upon, who's, the, person upon whom the withholding rate is determined. So for example, if you're paying through an NQI, you look through to the beneficial loaner, that person will be treated as a payee for Chapter 3. As much as possible, we tried to keep with that system for Chapter 4. Um, exceptions to this notably are the non-participating FFIs. They are treated as a payee no matter what capacity they're acting because a payment to a non-participating FFI will be withheld upon at 30%, regardless of whether they're acting as an intermediary, a flow-through entity, or if they are the beneficial owner of the payment. Um, and just, I just want to check in. Am I speaking slow enough? Because I do have a tendency to go fast. I think you're doing very well. The slow is good. OK, let me know if I need to slow down further. Um, OK, so for the payee definition, generally you're talking at a non-participating FFI. That's a payee. With respect to a participating FFI, you are generally going to be looking through them. So the participating FFI is not treated as a payee. The reason for this has to do with our election to pass up and keeping the withholding of Chapter 3 and Chapter 4 together. Um, what we've done, we heard a lot of comments from the industry as to change the election to pass up. Um, and many U.S. withholding agents have asked us, please not to make this unilateral, so that an FFI could just say, I'm not going to do the withholding. I'm going to pass it up to the U.S. withholding agent. And the U.S. withholding agent has to deal with it all, um, especially with respect to gross proceeds. They thought this was going to be very difficult. So what we've done is a compromise. We've said that if you are withholding for Chapter 3, basically for all payments of U.S. source to DAP where you already have a responsibility to withhold, you will continue to do the withholding for Chapter 3 and 4 together. It's not going to be an election to pass up. It's just going to be passed up automatically. With respect to gross proceeds, we took that off the table and said that the FFIs will be doing their own withholding for gross proceeds. Um, I think if that is a problem for some of the FFIs or for U.S. withholding agents who wanted to have the option to do gross proceeds withholding to kind of make it a service they make available to their clients, um, we really need to hear comments on that. But currently, it's a pass-up for Chapter 3. It is not generally a pass-up for gross proceeds. Um, the one exception is if a FFI elects to be a QI, and as a QI elects to do the withholding, 
for Chapter 3, it can also elect to do the withholding for Chapter 4. In fact, it'll be required to do so. So in all cases, withholding for Chapter 3 and 4 will stay together. So just to make it clear how this is going to happen, if I'm a QI and I, elect, and I have an elected withholding for Chapter 3, I'm going to be passing up Chapter 3 to the U.S. withholding agent. I'm also going to be passing up my Chapter 4 withholding. So I will first be passing up a pool that represents, because Chapter 4 always hits first, that indicates how much of this payment is made to with respect to recalcitrant account holders or with respect to non-participating FFIs. And all you're passing up is a pool that says 50% should be withheld upon at 30% coming off the top. So it should be simple for the U.S. withholding agent to apply this. Um, and then everything that's left over, you'll be indicating why there's no withholding and you'll be dealing with your Chapter 3, which will be generally passing up documentation with respect to that individual account holder. Yeah, I, I think, to some of the utility of, of uh, as Danielle said, keeping Chapter 3 and 4 together is we want a, a uh, not an overly complicated information reporting system. And what we're doing is, uh, for the people who are familiar with the Form 1042S, uh, we're going to be uh, amending the form to incorporate both Chapter 4 and Chapter 3 on one form. So it, it, it makes sense to keep Chapter 4 and 3 together uh, because, you know, basically the way these rules will work is, is for the most part, uh, a withholding agent will look at whether Chapter 4 applies first uh, with respect to a payment of, of U.S. source to debt income, and then we'll look to uh, what if, if chapter three apply, then whether Chapter 3 should apply. And the other point I just wanted to make when Danielle was asking about or referring to the uh, uh, potential for comments on gross proceeds withholding, I'd also point out that uh, you know, under the current rules, uh, QIs can pass up to their withholding agent uh, the 1099 reporting responsibilities with respect to U.S. non-exempt recipients. Um, and, and under fact, under the, these rules, there's reporting both with, with respect to uh, income and proceeds. And I think we'd also like to hear comments on uh, whether there's utility in, in a pass-up of gross proceeds reporting as well. Because right now, what would happen is, is if, uh, if the QI is dealing with a withholding agent only with respect to U.S. source to death income, uh, they, they wouldn't be directly dealing with gross proceeds reporting and presumably then the QI would always have to have to perform that, that withholding even if they passed up uh, the responsibility of 10 on reporting to their withholding agents. So in terms of uh, facilitating this most easily for QIs in developing reporting systems, we'd like to hear some comments about how that could work. Okay. Um, so just to kind of sum that up, the other reason we really wanted to keep Chapter 3 and Chapter 4 withholding together was to ensure that no one had double withholding. If we, if for any payment, Chapter 4 will hit first, but the cap will always be 30%. So if you're withheld upon for Chapter 4, you will not be withheld upon for Chapter 3. Um, so as long as the Chapter 3 and 4 remain together, we won't have that problem. Um, so that's a basic theory of what we did with the payee definition. It's generally following the Chapter 3 model, and it's going to hinge off of the person whose withholding rate is going to determine how much will be withheld. Um, moving on to due diligence. Um, with respect to individuals, um, we basically kept the system that we used in Notice 2011-34. Most of the steps are there. They're not listed as steps, but the substance of the steps are there. Um, we also want to note that, you know, obviously we didn't tell you the order things have to be done in. We we're really taking an effort not to micromanage exactly how everything needs to be done because we understand the different financial institutions are, have different systems and what may work for one may not work for another. So we're trying to allow the financial institutions maximum flexibility. Um, but basically, the $250 exception still remain. That was steps one and two from notice 2011-34. Um, the first one is with respect to deposit accounts. The other is with respect to all other accounts. Um, we've also retained the electronic search. Um, only changes that we've made to that, we've removed care of address as an electronic search um, from the electronic search. It is still in DISHA. The only address you have on file for someone is a care of address or a hold mail instruction. You will still need to look through your manual search for this. You will still need to treat it as U.S. indicia when you're opening the account. But you do not need to do an electronic search for a care of address alone. Um, the reason is we just thought it was impractical. There's just too many ways to structure care of addresses. You could have third-party names of the line, and there's no way 
that the FFIs were going to be able to find all of them, so we took it out. Um, we have added a U.S. telephone number, and we should clarify a current U.S. telephone number. Um, the reason being, we just couldn't think of any reason why we wouldn't do it. It's basically the same as an address, and we'll be treated the same. Um, just a note, um, this will probably be changed for Chapter 3 as well, because we are going to have to coordinate these systems. So if any changes we discuss to due diligence, to standards of knowledge, or to presumption rules, you should expect to see those same changes happening for Chapter 3 to keep these um, two regimes consistent. Um, those are the basic changes with respect to the electronic search. With respect to accounts over a million dollars, this is basically a combination of the private banking step, which was Step 3 in Notice 2011-34, and the high value step, which was Step 5 in Notice 2011-34. I know we've heard a lot of people take the position that we've gotten rid of the private banking search, and we, to some degree, that's correct. You are no longer looking for the words private banking, it no longer matters whether an account is a private banking account, but the substance of the test still remains. We've raised the threshold to a million dollars. So if you're under a million, all you need to do is an electronic search. All the other tests will be for accounts over a million dollars. Essentially, you're gonna be doing three things. You'll have the electronic search, which will be done for all accounts. Um, you'll have a manual search, which will be done for all accounts that were not available in the electronic search. So for example, PDF files that you couldn't search easily on a file, that'll be done in the manual search. Although we have limited the amount of documents that you have to look at. Um, so now all you'll be looking at are the current files and certain files, certain things that must be included in the current files, such as account opening procedures in the last five years, um, any documentation obtained with account opening. Um, there is a list of a few things that must be included in the current file, but the goal is really to limit your search of the manual search to the current files, so you're not having to go back to some warehouse where you store documents from 20 years ago. Um, the other thing we've done with respect to the manual search is we've limited it to items that were not available in the electronic search. So for example, if during my electronic search, I pull up an address, a telephone number, and information on a POA, and I know I've got information on these three items, I do not need to search for this in a manual search. Um, so really, it's to your advantage of your electronic systems updated as much as possible, because it can almost save you from doing the enhanced review. Right, right. so as an example of this, if, if the FFI has already uh, classified the, the individual account holder, uh, in accordance with their residence or nationality, and that's reflected in the electronic file, the, the FFI could rely on that determination without actually going back to the original source document that it used to make that determination. Absolutely. The final thing, um, and this is a key part um, adopted from the private banking test, was if there's a relationship manager for the account, and the account is over a million dollars, and it's your value at the end of the time, prior year, um, the FFI will be required to go to the relationship manager and test the actual knowledge of the relationship manager. This is the only thing that the relationship manager has to do himself. Everything else can be done by the tax department or anyone else the FFI assigns. Um, other exceptions that we've added, um, and this will help the QIs in the audience. If you've already documented an account for purposes of QI, you do not need to redocument it for FATCA. We're talking individual accounts only. Um, and it must be documented, so you couldn't have been relying on presumption rules alone. But we didn't think it was necessary. And again, if that's for QI or for Chapter 61. So if you've already documented those accounts and you know whether they're US or foreign, you're done. Um, those are the basic changes with respect to the individual account holders. Um, I'm gonna move on briefly to talk about the changes with respect to entities. Yeah, could I just, yeah. just want to mention too that we, we kept the premise of, of the more limited aggregation rules for the account balances because as Danielle was mentioning, you know, we have sort of a three-tier system of accounts under the threshold do not have to be, uh, pre-existing accounts uh, don't have to be uh, documented under these procedures. We have the electronic search procedures for US and DISHA for the accounts uh, over the threshold and then for the million uh, million dollar accounts and and and, uh, and higher you know we have the additional due diligence uh, for purposes of determining uh, the thresholds uh, we pretty much kept to the aggregation rules that that we uh, specified in notice 2011 34 
uh, basically with reliance on on the FFI's own systems uh, and not not have not imposing a requirement to actually uh, develop new systems to aggregate accounts. Uh, one one notable uh, thing to to point out, I think, in terms of the relationship manager test, is that we do have a special rule where um, if a, if an account is is managed by a relationship manager. Uh, and, and we understand that typically those are arranged by the by the primary client. Uh, the the uh, relationship manager will have to aggregate all of those accounts, uh, including those that are held uh, by the client through through entities such as trusts and so forth. So I, I wanted to point out that that nuance to the aggregation rule because it's pretty pretty important for those FFIs that maintain the the private banking uh, accounts for high net high net worth people. So moving on to the theory behind entity account due diligence, um, I'm not going to get into details. We have 35 pages of regs telling you with respect to every single Chapter 4 status exactly what must be done and what exceptions apply, for example, for offshore accounts or for pre-existing accounts. Um, so I think those are pretty clear. Um, you'll have a chance to go through those, and I'm sure there will be a session going over those. Um, but the basic theory for the entity accounts is that U.S. withholding agents and FFIs will be following the same set of rules, since they're both having to classify the entities, same, the entities in the same way. The difference will be whether the account is an onshore or an offshore account. Um, the onshore account rules are going to be generally applicable to U.S. withholding agents and any U.S. branches that the FFI has. The general onshore rule is that you'll be documenting an account with a WFN or W9. In certain cases, there'll be additional documentation required. Um, the general offshore rule, which will be applicable to the FFIs most of the time and to any obviously foreign branches of the U.S. withholding agents, will generally be the documentation standard. We really try to um, rely on documentation in lieu of WA BEMS as much as possible because we heard a lot of comments from the industry complaining about the fact that they wouldn't be able to get a foreign customer to fill out a WA BEM in all cases, especially if they're not investing in U.S. source income. So wherever we could, we allowed the reliance on um, documentary evidence instead of that. Um, I want to note that the offshore exception is an exception, and it's just an option. So if you decide that it's easier for you to use a withholding certificate, you are welcome to do that. Um, the other thing we introduced um, for offshore accounts is the concept of a written statement. A written statement was also something suggested by the industry. It's in lieu of filling out a W-8 bin, you can get a statement from your client that indicates that they're eligible for an exception. That statement can either be something that they submit on their own that you accept, or some, a question and answer that you create as part of your account opening procedures. It's up to you how to do it. We just need it to be signed under penalties of perjury. Um, you, know, you can also, if you want, just copy the, the questions asked on the W-8 bin and include it in your own format. We want to point out that this is not going to be treated as a substitute form. It can only be used with respect to offshore accounts. There may be one or two limited cases it's allowed to be used with onshore accounts. Um, and it generally must be used in addition to documentary evidence. So you'll have a written statement, and then you'll get documentary evidence that generally supports the claims made. Um, the final change we've made is um, we've done as much as possible. We've reduced the requirements for pre-existing accounts. This is primarily for FFIs, but we've also done this with some respects with respect to um, onshore accounts. So U.S. withholding agents will get to take advantage of some of those rules. Um, it's really just a matter of degree here. So times we can rely on general knowledge in lieu of getting documentation. There are times we allow you to rely on lesser forms of documentation and uh, permit you to make some presumption, um, assumptions. So instead of proving every single element of the test, for example, to show that this person meets the requirements to be a pension plan, they're generally, for example, going to be just relying on a document that indicates the person would be a pension plan in its own country, and the general knowledge of the withholding agent that there's no reason to know they shouldn't qualify. Um, so as much as possible, we try to reduce the standards done for pre-existing accounts. Um, I think those are the basics that we've done for entity accounts. Um, the only exception I want to point out is for FFIs only, we do have a 250,000 threshold that's been added. If you're under $250,000 and it's in an entity account, you do not need to document it. However, if at a later date that account goes above a million dollars, you then will need to document that account. 
Um, I think unless there's any questions immediately on the pre-existing drills or the um, individual, I'll move on to questions. Uh, panelists, any questions on the presentation so far? Okay. Okay, very good. Thank you. I appreciate it's quite difficult speaking into a camera. We have a list of questions submitted to us from the industry. May I proceed with those? Well, um, are they about the pre-existing drills? Because otherwise John would like to go on. He's got some... Yes, John, go ahead, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I just point out, too, just to to round out Danielle's presentation, that the way these the, the regulations are structured is that uh, we, we lay out for each of the relevant classes of, of entity uh, account holders what the particular documentation requirement is. So uh, when you look at the regulations and you look at the, the, you know, we have one section that mainly deals with the requirement of FFI, such as documentation, withholding and reporting. What those, what those rules do is they cross-reference back to the rules for U.S. withholding agents to identify entity account holders, and we specify for each class what the particular requirement is. And that, that's how you want to look at these rules, uh, because you have to, the FFI would have to determine the classification to each particular type based on the documentation that we've specified. And the reason we've done all of these rules is to provide the maximum flexibility. If we had a one-size-fits-all rule, obviously we'd be picking the higher standard of documentation. And what we've done is breaking them all out into all of the 20-something various categories is that for certain categories where we thought they were less of a risk, we allowed a lesser documentation standard. Yeah, because the distinction between individual and, and entity accounts, where the entity accounts got, got more extensive on the documentation, is that the individuals are basically concerned with identifying uh, specified U.S. person account holders, whereas for the entities, uh, you know, there, there's a uh, there's a premise to uh, look at uh, FFIs and determine whether they're participating. There's also the concept of the U.S. owned foreign entity, where uh, the FFI would be required to identify the U.S. owners of certain foreign entities in certain cases that we specified. And then we have all of the various uh, entities that are excluded. Uh, from the requirements of entity account holders that are excluded from the requirements of FATCA. So that's where we uh, we had to get pretty detailed on, on specifying all these different classifications of the entity accounts, and that's why they're a bit more more extensive uh, than the individual account holder rules. Uh, the other thing I wanted to just add in, um, I just remembered I didn't touch on it, um, was the timing changes. Um, for individual accounts, we generally have the same idea taken from notice 2011-34, that accounts for over a million dollars will generally need to be done within one year. Accounts, all other accounts will have two years to finish the documentation. Um, the one exception that we made is for high value accounts, the manual review portion, so not the electronic search that has to be done in a year, and not the actual relationship manager test, the actual knowledge test, that has to be done in a year. But the manual part of the review, we've extended that out to two years. And obviously this is in response to FFI comments, um, where a lot of them thought this was, it was very difficult to do this within a one-year period, especially at the FIs who have a lot of high-value accounts. So we're responding to the industry's concerns there and giving them more time. Um, with respect to entity accounts, you will generally have two years from the time your FFI agreement starts to complete your due diligence procedures. The only exception to that is, one, if you know that they're non-participating FFI, and when I say know that they're non-participating FFI, it, we don't consider it actual knowledge. Obviously, if you're doing business with Deutsche Bank, you know they're, they're a financial institution. We're not going to say that just because their name indicates it or you know in the industry that they're a financial institution, that they'll be treated as this prima facie FFI. It's really that you've gotten a form back from them where they've stated, I'm a non-participating FFI, or you've asked them for a TIN and they've said, no, I'm not, not, I'm not participating. Those are cases where you have actual knowledge that someone's non-participating. The other case is if you have it available in your electronically searchable information that the person is a QI or an NQI, that's a case where they'll be considered a prima facie FFI. In that case, you need to have, you will have a year from the date of your FFI agreement to document that account holder, after which you'll be required to treat them as non-participating. In all other cases, you'll get two years. Right, and these, and these drills, uh, Danielle, is referring to these timelines, these start with the effective date of the FFI agreement. That's, and that's for FFIs, for any U.S. withholding agents in the room, 
your two years time clock basically starts on 1-1-13. Okay, uh, I'm presuming that mo most of the audience is mainly interested in the requirements of the, the FFR.